Fallout New Vegas lets you kill pretty much anyone you want, and that's great and all, but only an insane person would want to kill a person in a video game for no reason. Can you beat Fallout New Vegas as a godless pacifist? First, we must ask ourselves what a godless pacifist is. The best way to explain it is to say what this challenge was supposed to be. Can you beat Fallout New Vegas without attacking anything and without taking any damage? That might sound lame, but give me two minutes and I'll prove to you that God was nowhere to be found in this challenge. After Doc Mitchell gave birth to me, I picked Maurice as my name as a high tier reference. Did a reenactment of God making my brother. For special, I went with what felt accurate. It's been a long time since I've cheesed my way through New Vegas with speech. This might be hard to believe, but I was actually younger than I am now the last time I did it. Strength, endurance, charisma, all worthless. Speech can be raised with maxed out intelligence and luck. Agility is for sneaking, perception for the compass and picking locks, lockpick, speech, and sneak as my skills, skilled and good natured as my traits, and began the real game. My first stop was Chet. When examining the contents of his pants for possible trades, I realized how little value Caps would have in this playthrough. Try thinking for once, and imagine in your head a white wall and a projector. Now imagine the projector turns on, and it projects a video of me telling you how few items are worth buying. You've got chems, a uh, Hasbro make your own chems kit, and armor for cosmic benefits or minor stat advantages, and that's it. I initially wasn't sure how I wanted to handle this. If I wanted to see how much of the main questline I could complete, or if I wanted to just beat the game as quickly as possible. I hit Gene skydiving and decided to turn around and inadvertently cause a bloodbath. The experience would be very satisfying for me. But I noticed something on my map. A vault, just outside of Good Springs, that I'd never seen before. Vault 28. With each step down the ladder I went, it felt like the hairs on my neck were trying to fly away. I pressed onward, one foot in front of the other just like Lord said. When I got down there, a combination of emotions hit me that cannot be described with words. I accidentally stumbled into the Among Us vault, courtesy of a mod I forgot I had installed. I was orange, and Purple's jumpsuit was suspiciously not filled with a living person yet. The imposter who isn't me caused a mesothelioma leak in the vents, and inhaling it hurts real bad. I couldn't continue the mod without giving myself some health. This is mod content, it doesn't count. I'm orange, purple's MIA, the bone meal from Lime's hand is all over the door. If you're not writing this down, it's okay, just use your fingers to keep track. I found Blue's body as I scrambled for life support. They were got by something sharp. Unable to find life support and running low on breathing fluid, I accepted my demise in style, repaired the oxygen, and began putting the pieces of this puzzle together. Let's think through this illogically. Blue and Cyan were both slashed, indicating that the killer was colorblind. Tubs, bathrooms, and the stalls were all clear. Yellow's lack of motion as I approached him startled me. I was too late. He was gone. So was Brown. With no wounds, their death was shrouded in mystery. What happened down there is anyone's guess. But as the vault's greatest and only living detective, only I was allowed to guess, which made me automatically correct. To uncover the truth, I had to get my hands dirty. Every body was gently carried to the meeting room for discussion. I, Orange, Lime was by the door, Blue was on the end, followed by Cyan, Yellow, Pink, Black, White, Brown, Red, and Green. The only missing member of our sleepover is Lime. I called Mom, told her Lime wasn't who he said he was, and that's when Lime came to kill me. You know what my mistake was, don't you? If you don't, go back and read the obituaries of the deceased crewmates again. See if you can figure out who the imposter was. I'll tell you who it was at the end of the video. Back on the saddle, I returned to Good Springs in my bravest attire and set off for the strip. We're not doing any more bullshit. This is gonna be quick, clean, by the book. I should have mentioned earlier that I set my max health to 1, so any damage kills me. And as for not attacking anything, my general strategy will be to not attack anything. No Sloan or repairing Snuffle spine for me. I saw me a path to the other way, I guess. And a sign from God. A playthrough of New Vegas without taking radiation damage isn't enough of a challenge on its own to be worth a video. But adding it here makes all the sense in the world. Radiation damage going from 199 to 200 causes my heart to hurt. I gave myself a bit of health, sped up time to turn my body into a lava lamp, stopped it at 1000 out of 1000, thinking I'd broken something. I did the opposite. I was right where I wanted to be. 
The instant I take radiation damage, I drop dead, even with my Halloween costume. I took the safe route north by passing through Hidden Valley. The dead robots kinda put the fear of God in me, which of course brought out my motherly instincts. I tried to round up a couple half dozen scorpions to throw back at Black Mountain to retake it in my name. I'm pretty confident that I was more enthusiastic about that plan than the rest of them put together. That's why I abandoned my babies and immediately faced the consequences. First, psychologically with Neil who ran up to me to say nothing. Then the death claws sinking down to my level. For the first time in my life, I was hoping to find Victor out here, somewhere, anywhere. Instead, I got the sound of gunfire off in the distance. Death claws are sensitive to sound. They backed off, the world's largest mistake burned me alive, and I instigated a conflict between the fiends and the NCR by forcing one of the soldiers to cross the line. Sadly, all of the soldiers survived. The addition of the NCR uniform would have made getting into the strip take less time. However, not needing the amenities of the modern man, I sold anything to get me up to 2,000 caps, and gave amounts of money I'm too lazy to count to Hotface. One of the mods I've got restores cut content, and he's supposed to lure you back behind the building to rob me. I might not have gotten robbed, but I felt robbed. Before continuing onward, I played around a bit with my own death to watch the animations. It feels so brutal dying in first person while being able to see your own body. Going back to mods for a second, I don't know which one it is, someone in the comments will tell me, but one of them adds these notes when initially you meet a faction, and the idea that this guy who got shot in the head is keeping a diary and ending each entry by signing off with love to himself, it repairs some of the damage from whatever hurt my heart a while ago. I already forgot what it was. The kings presented me with the perfect opportunity to get revenge on that piece of sh who hit me with a golf club a few minutes ago. It's actually worse than you thought. He ran for the children. I guess he needed practice. Oris was a walking disappointment. He killed the golfer with like 8 shots because I'm playing on very hard. There's absolutely no reason to not be playing on that difficulty because difficulty shouldn't make a difference. And he ripped me off. I had to hire him a second time to do the job I was hired to do. He shot these savages with his gun and they plopped over real odd like. Their lack of bullet holes, lack of screaming, and the inconsistency with the number of shots he fired told me something wasn't adding up. Next, someone was hurt. The kings sent me to interrogate the victim for answers or clues. They were all alive, the problem most likely resolved itself. I've got more pressing matters to attend to. The strip has never been as beautiful as it is with its legs open in the dead of night. Now, big picture end goal here is the platinum chip. That starts, always, with Benny. I used the three level ups from tracking him down to raise speech up to 64 and made my first move by talking to Benny. I convinced him to meet me up in his room alone, conversated with him for a moment, then agreed to talk to him again back down on the casino floor. This was where it all went wrong. I left his room first and waited for him down by the slots. The slippery son of a bitch only popped his head out for a second before he ran back upstairs. Normally you'd wait for him in his room and be ambushed when he tried to leave to go meet Benny. I too went back upstairs. Somehow, as I tried to use the elevator, I missed Benny using the elevator, and his goons got me. I couldn't go up there. Unsure of how to proceed, I acted like a good courier and met with Mr. House. He didn't have any words of wisdom for me. His only concern was the recovery of the chip. Our current predicament is Benny has the chip. I can't kill him, and he won't flee the strip unless I survive his ambush, which I can't do without attacking anything. I had a plan, or the loose approximation of one. What I didn't expect was Benny to be down on the casino floor. His dialogue gave it away. He wasn't supposed to be here. Using one of the few skills I'd put any points into, I pickpocketed Benny's sweet key and a Topps presidential suitcase off one of his guys. Rode the elevator again, neither key worked. I got a bullet-sized hole placed in my sternum, and I realized my hands were in Play-Doh they had no business opening. As I looted the keys, a rumble of thunder rocked the casino. Unfazed by a little wind, I used the key I borrowed to find Yes Man. Again, I'm pretty sure this is not something you're supposed to see. Having discovered Yes Man with Benny still at the strip, I thought maybe Mr. House might have something to say about it. He didn't, and that was okay. Out there exists a wild card that can be used to turn a house into a homeless shelter. The big cloud in the sky knew what I was up to and set the mood accordingly. Repcon HQ got a key card inside that gets me to the beef jerky pretending to be Mr. House. To obtain the key card, 
I had to lie to Sunny Smiles to get her to hand over her guide to committing petty crimes. It temporarily increased my lockpick skill long enough to get the door open, find the keycard, and realize I went to the wrong place. Assuming the real card was somewhere in the building, I cracked another lock found a stealth boy, and confronted a game-breaking anomaly. One of my mods lets me convince machines to become my friend if my science skill is smart enough. This particular robot has no conversational skills, and the only speech option is a looping failure. Worse still, the floating tin seeks me out. And, thanks to a few poorly timed saves, I only had moments to re-unlock the security door and activate the stealth boy to avoid the scanner. On the second floor, I was able to avoid the roaming hall monitors with the stealth boy, and on the third, I confused the scanner by asking for ice cream. All that effort was a waste. There was never a lucky 38 keycard here. I lied to myself, and I wanted payback. But I had to get past the main floor bully again. I tried exactly once, before clipping myself through the wall by repeatedly quick saving and quick loading while pressing myself against an object. Normally, you would fall through the void and get placed at a predetermined location. I'm not sure why that didn't happen here. The Lucky 38 keycard is on a desk at H&H &H Tools, conveniently located outside the shithole that calls itself North Vegas Square. Within about two minutes of entering the building, I got myself stuck in a cubicle between a pair of automated laser turrets. I never felt more at home. I need to get to the area at the top of these stairs. There are just a few very small things in my way. If I touch the water, I die. There are two robots in the water shooting lasers at me, and the stairs are rigged with explosive mines. And the Mr. Gutless with his hairdryer shows up too. This was one of the most daunting tasks I've ever had to complete. The only time I cheated was when I brought up the console just to have a moment to see what exactly I was working with. To get there in the first place, you need to jump from the front office around the doorway onto the ledge on the wall. Then immediately get onto these water filtration pumps. Then onto this square thing in the back. Quickly pick up all four mines without letting them detonate, make it to the top all without getting hit by a laser, then celebrate with a seizure because it's just that easy. It's been a long journey, we've been through a lot, but the key card joined the party. I rendezvoused with my ego back at the Lucky 38, opened Mr. House's secret chamber, and when he asked why I was destroying his life's work, I gave him the only answer I had. I didn't kill him, the machines kept him alive indefinitely. House is gone, that's it, Benny's ass belongs to me. I returned to the tops, picked a few locks, told Yes Man House was gone, and confronted Benny. Nothing changed. I thought I was stuck forever when Opportunity saw me order Arby's and struck me for it. NCR guards are inside the casino. They're sworn to protect the most innocent. The order of operations tells us that if I commit a petty crime to provocate someone into committing a felony, the NCR will have to save me. Turns out, the chairmen have automatic weapons. My escape was never gonna happen. My body would be more whole than person by the time I got to the door. Before I let the dream die, I became God just to see if the army would save me, which they didn't. In the current situation, I cannot progress Fallout New Vegas without attacking anything or without taking damage. That being said, with some very slight cosmic f***ery, there is a small glimmer of hope. To attempt this, I traveled back in time to when I entered the tops for the first time. I cheated, but I'll explain why. Female characters in Fallout New Vegas get the Black Widow perk that opens up new speech options for some situations. One of them lets you dirty a bed with Benny. I could have easily started a new character with the same stats and gotten back to the strip in like 15 minutes. Or I could just do this. In the aftermath, Benny fled the strip with the chip. Bobby said he went to Caesarland for his birthday party, so that's where I was headed. Everything you've seen so far hasn't been my fault. I tried like hell to make this a normal playthrough. To get things back to normal, I borrowed Veronica to unlock a door for me. It did not go well. I'll give the Brotherhood some credit. Their sandstorm was effective at being a sandstorm. In addition to the sandstorm, there were my babies I left there so long ago and Veronica's insatiable bloodlust. She said they'd never see the haymakers coming and she meant it. I had to tell her to f***ing back off and then sprint to the door to keep her from killing any of them. But my god, does that bitch have an altitude problem. I calmed her down by pushing her, she opened the door, I set her free, the Brotherhood were dead to me forever, and Cottonwood Cove was back in my eyes. Everything was going great, then all of a sudden I'm being chased by a winged death, and with no way to defend myself, my only thought was to offer it something in exchange for my life. Nothing worth giving it could be removed. I was already thinking of what riddle I was going to tell the angel at the gate to confuse him enough to let me sneak in when an NCR soldier emerged from the wasteland to save me. The smart play would have been to run while the Cazador was killing that brave man. 
Instead, I sat on my antenna and watched, drugged some antifreeze, and hoped for the best. I found a few spears and a body a good bit outside Novak. From this distance, I considered a kill on Myrtle to be like a supercharged creeper. If I hit this, I win. I've got Project Nevada installed, which allows you to tweak a ton of stuff. I made sure to set everything to their default values for this challenge, including disabling strength-based ranges for throwable weapons. I crouched, made an emergency save, and let that motherfucker fly. I don't know if you've ever thrown anything before, but it's hard, alright? It's like CPR. It's the thought and the effort that counts not the result. Once I discovered the cove, I immediately returned to Good Springs and entered the bar. I've got unfinished business down in the basement. The town's best kept secret is a family of centaurs living down in the caves beneath the Prospector Saloon. Big Mama and her boys don't take too kindly to newcomers. I'd heard whispers of some cool guy down there, but couldn't get past the cougar. I cheated, enabled god mode, and met Slimbo, the saddest motherfucker you've ever seen. Hey. Not to be one of those mod reviewer types who offers their opinion and thoughts on a mod, but this whole tsunami of sadness thing was overkill even for me. I was getting the f**k out of there when my ears overheard a job. The paper included symbols that, when combined, explained that Wolfgang and friend were willing to pay someone to kill people. I can't put my hands on anyone, and if a feather touches me, my bones will turn to dust and clog up my arteries. I'm the perfect bounty hunter. Steven Randall, the owner of New Haven Bounty Board tasked me with killing Tom Quigley and retrieving his finger. Up until he mentioned the finger, I really thought I could weasel my way through at least one bounty. Luckily, I didn't have time to think of how I'd cause an accident that would remove his finger because a pair of ghouls broke into the office and killed us both. That ended that little adventure. Things got back to normal at Cottonwood Cove. The most distracting thing here, without a doubt, was how colorful everything was. Caesar gave me a simple mission, destroy what's under the fort and report back. He handed me the chip. I got a few more details from Benny about his grand plan. My equipment was returned to me. I went down into the weather station and immediately died because the entire substation is irradiated. I can't go down there, which introduces another exciting twist into this playthrough. You cannot leave the fort with the platinum chip. Fast traveling is disabled while you have it, and if you try to leave, a guard will follow you to the ends of the earth to get it back. I'm getting carried away. I saw a Legion soldier being crucified, and he seemed pretty happy about it. Now we can get back to that stalker freak. I went down to the trenches to try to find a place to execute my plan. There's one theoretical way out. That quick save, quick load exploit works anywhere on any surface. The added pressure of really not wanting to talk to that guy who was only walking towards me to do his job because of my f up made this next to impossible. Then I spent about five minutes hopelessly stuck between two sheets of metal I'd gotten stuck between. This was frightened animal panicked breaking bones to escape levels of stuck. Towards the end, I knew there was no way out, and that's when I threw down the cartons of cigarettes to end my life. That's not what you think. In Fallout and Skyrim, when multiple objects interact with each other and you in a confined space or at high speeds, you can be hurt. Why was I trying to kill myself when I could have just reloaded a save, when that's what would have happened when I died? I don't have a good answer for that. My persistence paid off. I successfully clipped through the gate and escaped the fort. I didn't have a plan anymore. I wandered the hills, looking for a sign until I found myself at Hoover Dam. The fake cement kept me from getting the necessary air to land in the drink. Entering and exiting the dam allowed me to get back to the strip to brag to Mr. House about what I just did. I can't side with Mr. House. Yes Man was programmed to have feelings for me and the whole radiation thing. The last thing Mr. House said to me before I made the decision to end his life for the third time today was beautiful. He'll live to fight another day and I took care of a couple small things I can get through pretty quick. I got the Omertas handled, the Brotherhood were not a threat, and the White Gloves were next. Chauncey pointed me towards Migraine to learn more about the strange glove people. In trying to handle that, a missing persons case caught my attention. I had to investigate. One lead led me to a health inspector who led me to a freezer where a powder ganger robbed me. He had a pipe. I was in no position to say no. I need to go back for a second. Possibly as a side effect of the open strip mod, or god knows what else, ordinary people like Emily Ortle or NCR troopers inserted themselves into the white glove. The majority of the NCR troopers were in the pool room. The freezer I was in, where the powder ganger found me, was off the pool room. Powder gangers and NCR troopers are not friends. That might be an understatement. I'd seen enough mayhem. I was almost sick to my stomach. I told Heck that his son was still alive to spark a riot and left. The wild card has a few side bets to place. Continuing with the great cons. Nothing happened on the way to Red Rock. It was so boring. 
so perfect. The boomers were largely the same. Their bombardment never got me, Pearl rolled out the red artillery for me, the puzzle pieces were in place. All we needed was the glue. Yes Man didn't give me the chance to save President Kimball, the NCR had no reason to hate me, because they didn't care about me at all. That changed when I powered the El Dorado substation. Activating it immediately caused malfunctions in their guns. Every time, it was the damnedest thing. There's no path forward without all that power. Yes Man's lava lamps won't power themselves. Requiring a stealth boy, I returned to Good Springs to see Doc Mitchell walking home with his son. Checked his bag for invisible goodies, couldn't find anything. Cracked open the safe in the school to find a stealth boy, stole the NCR's party favors to cause arguments later, and returned to the strip, prepped for war. At the dam, I shot a memorial I found to see if there were any bitches nearby, and did everything I possibly could. Nothing. My lone toaster lived up to the name I just gave him. The NCR handled the legion towards the front of the dam. My centurion distracted the Securitron while I ran into the small intestine of the Hoover Dam, convinced a pair of chuckle f**ks to run away so I could install Yes Man, and had to get clever to keep going. With this one helmet, everyone would know I'm legion to the core. The NCR Swiss cheesed me when I blew up the dam, so I lured them to my legion sisters to see if they're as tough as I claimed they were. Blew open the generator, ran at the normal speed but with the key pressed a little harder than usual, and made a run for the gates to oblivion. Positive thinking propelled me forward when all hope seemed lost. I entered the Legates camp and couldn't outrun fate. No matter what I tried, the Legates men always killed me before I could talk to him. That short stint I had as a cosplayer last paragraph put us back in the red and I convinced the Beast of the Weast to head back down the river. It was not my intention for General Oliver to save me at the very last minute, he did it anyway. He got a reward, and I beat Fallout New Vegas without attacking anything, and without taking damage. But I couldn't help but think that with this suit, maybe I was owed a little... vacation. If you enjoyed the video or learned anything, leave a like. Leave a dislike if you didn't enjoy the video or didn't learn anything. Thanks to the Champion Tier supporters as well as other channel members for making videos like this one possible. Join the Mitten Squad Discord server by going to mitten.land. Follow me on Twitter, at Mitten Squad. My name is Paul of Mitten Squad. Have a wonderful day.